Eight years ago, MongoDB was an internal project at TenGen, a company that was trying to build a platform as a service out of open source components. The team at TenGen realized that the platform as a service play would be too complex and too difficult to build. Since MongoDB was the most valuable component of that project, they narrowed their focus to this new document-oriented database and changed the name of the company to MongoDB. In today's episode, MongoDB CTO Elliot Horowitz describes the history of MongoDB, the open source project as well as the company, which recently released a managed cloud service, MongoDB Atlas. Elliot explains how the company has architected the MongoDB Atlas service on top of AWS and why developers often want a managed service as their database rather than managing database servers themselves. This is a great episode if you yourself are building a managed cloud service or if you are thinking about where to host a instance of a database. Should you host it on the cloud? Should you host it on a managed cloud service provider? There are pros and cons to each of these approaches. Full disclosure, MongoDB is a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. I hope you enjoy this episode. The Insight Data Engineering Program helps software engineers level up their careers. Data engineering is at the cutting edge of how we build software, and it involves some of the most interesting open source and distributed technologies, such as Apache Spark, Kafka, and NoSQL databases. Insight Data Engineering is free because they partner with top companies like Facebook, Uber, Capital One, and Slack. You can learn about data engineering at Insight Data Engineering. And if you go to insightdataengineering.com slash SE Daily, you can apply. Listeners of this show will be advanced straight to the coding challenge of the application process. If you get accepted, you get to learn how to build useful products in a self-directed program. There are workspaces in New York and Palo Alto that you can utilize during the short seven-week data engineering training process, and you have access to free cloud computing resources and a network of over 600 data engineers and data scientists from over 100 companies. Insight provides this support until you find a great data engineering position at a top company. Apply now at insightdataengineering.com slash SE Daily. Skip straight to the coding challenge. This is a special offer for Software Engineering Daily listeners. Thanks to Insight Data Engineering. And if you want to level up your career, if you want to learn some new skills and change what you are working on in your work environment, and perhaps get a job upgrade if you're looking for a different type of job, or if you're between academia and your career path and you want to build a little more skill before you jump on that career path, learn about data engineering at Insight Data Engineering. Go to insightdataengineering.com slash SE Daily to apply and skip straight to that coding challenge. And thanks again to Insight Data Engineering for being a new sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. You can also check out the interview I did with Insight Data Engineering several months ago um, on Software Engineering Daily. Let's get back to this episode. Elliot Horowitz is the CTO of MongoDB. Elliot, welcome to Software Engineering Daily. Thanks. Great to be here. So I would like our conversation today to focus on how a database company works. And I want to touch on product development, the engineering, the business model. We're talking about MongoDB specifically because you are the CTO there, but I think there will be lessons in this conversation that will be applicable to any kind of infrastructure business, certainly to database businesses. So in order to build our conversation in that direction, I want to start with the customer, who in this case is a developer. So when MongoDB started to gain popularity six or seven years ago, why did people start using it? What were those customer desires? Sure. So really the the main motivation for people trying out MongoDB and adopting MongoDB really came around from developers wanting to be more productive. So when people look at MongoDB, specifically developers, they tend to look at two things. One is the data model, right? So MongoDB uses documents instead of uh, the relational data model. 
and two is the distributed systems components of MongoDB. So the data model for MongoDB is documents, and documents, we believe, are a fundamentally, fundamentally easier data structures for developers to work with. They more naturally suit the way programming languages work, because you know documents map pretty well to objects. They naturally map to the way people think. You know, no one thinks about you know breaking up objects into you know tables, into rows and columns, but they do think about things as structures. And three documents lead to a lot of efficiency on the computing side. And the other big piece is distributed systems. So you know, starting out with simple things like high, high availability, and then moving on to um, horizontal scaling and geographic diversity. So really those two concepts are really what brought people to MongoDB, overall making it much easier to work with data, to store data, to work with data, to query data, and to get value out of the data. Those are absolutely true. And I also think that MongoDB gained popularity for similar reasons that Ruby on Rails gained popularity because these the, the, that document uh, centricity where you can think about documents more easily means that you can build prototypes with it more quickly, you can evolve those prototypes more quickly, uh, and you can just, it makes ease of use uh, a lot more straightforward. And I think this also coincided with a, you know, this, maybe not the beginning, but it was certain there was a, uh, I felt like there was a growth in uh, new developers starting to program around that time where MongoDB was getting popular. This was also when Ruby on Rails was gaining a lot of popularity. Uh, do you think that's an accurate depiction? Yeah, I think that you saw, you know, the growth of the, you know, the internet and web applications, the growth of mobile applications, which were sort of bringing in a whole new breed of software developers. Um, cloud computing starting to sort of be a real thing was a big deal because the cost of infrastructure was so low. You know, in the 80s, when app people were deploying applications or building applications, you know, the numbers we see is that 75% of the cost went to hardware and software and 25% went to developers. And now that's flipped, right? You know, 75% of the cost is developers and 25% is hardware and software. So making developers cost effective and very efficient is incredibly important. And the time to market of features is becoming paramount. And so I think that is where things like MongoDB and all the new programming languages, you know, whether it's Ruby or Python, are all sort of making a pretty big difference. And the other thing was that around this time, 2009 era, there were, so all these new developers that were joining, they were not people that were fluent in SQL. So they were totally open to, you know, oh, this is the way that we do databases, like documents, you know, it's just, it could, it could be totally organic for them. Um, and there are, there are lots of podcasts out there that have done comparisons between MongoDB and SQL, so I don't want to spend too much time on that area, but maybe we should spend a little time for people who need a refresher or who are kind of new to this. Explain some of the differences for the programming experience between document-oriented database like Mongo and a SQL database like MySQL. So fundamentally, the main difference is how you store the data. So in Mongo, you're storing data in documents. So documents in Mongo look very similar to JSON documents. So they're structured, you can have arrays, you can have nested elements, you can have arrays of nested elements. So for example, if you're storing information about a person and you want to store a list of all of their addresses and previous addresses, you would store a document with an array called addresses and you'd have a list of, that'd be a list of documents. And that document would have, you know, city, state, zip. It could have a field like current. It could have other fields like type. So it could be like a home or a school and you can sort of put in whatever you want there. And so then when you're going to look at a person in the database, it's just a single document. When you're mapping that to code, it's a single dictionary or object or whatever sort of the idiom is in your language. In a relational database, it's a little bit different, right? Because then you're gonna have a table for sort of for your core user information, and then a separate table for every address. And then what you have to do is sort of join those two tables together. And for two tables, it's not so bad. But for a typical user profile in a big application, it's not two tables, it's dozens of tables. And that's where things start to get pretty complicated. Okay. What about the query language uh, between Mongo and, and SQL? How do those differ? So, yeah, so the query language for Mongo, well, first of all, the first key thing is that Mongo does have a query language. You know, one of the things we tried very hard to do is keep the paradigms about relational databases as you know, similar as possible when, we, when people move to MongoDB. So there is a query language, there's a shell where you can go type things in. Indexing in MongoDB works exactly the same way it does as in a relational database. So there is a query language. The difference is that it's a query language designed for a document model. So SQL is very much designed for relations. 
And a lot of people have tried to sort of put JSON or hierarchy into SQL, and none of it seems to fit very well. We also wanted to modernize it in a number of ways to make it more programmatic, uh, to make it easier for you know developers to work with as opposed to the you know typing in SQL directly. So we uh, basically made a new query language for MongoDB you know, called the MongoDB query language. And um, it's really just a same kinds of things you can do in SQL, but just done in a very document-centric way. Now, today, there are many architectures that might have a combination of NoSQL and SQL databases. And then you also talked about this type of trend where SQL databases might try to build a, uh, a document-like interface and, and document-based languages, uh, databases, sometimes build a SQL-like interface on top of it. Why are these different types of polyglot database architectures useful, or, or are some of them not useful? Or maybe you could give me, give me some light on this polyglot notion. So certainly some are useful today and some may not be useful in the future. But, you know, f- frankly, you know, for, there'll be polyglot systems forever if for no other reason whether they're very large, complex relational systems being used today where the migration cost from going from a relational database to a document database is you know, way too costly to move. So Polyglot's going to be here and it's going to be around forever. As to if you're building a new application, I think that you know, the biggest challenge with you know, MongoDB and sort of all the sort of new databases are they, are they are still pretty new. So there are features that MongoDB simply doesn't have yet. And if you want one of those features, or if you're using a tool that only speaks to a relational database, you're going to have to use a relational database. You know, over time, I think we expect things like MongoDB to be able to handle more and more of the use cases in applications, but it's certainly not 100% ever, and definitely not you know, anywhere near that today. So we'll get back to where databases are today, but let's talk a little bit about the business, how the business has evolved. MongoDB came out of TenGen, which was a company that wanted to have a platform as a service that was based on open source tools. This sounds like a very reasonable idea for a 2007 business. Cloud was growing. We've seen it grow exponentially since then. So why did you end up pivoting to a database company? So when we first started TenGen, right, we were building a database, which became MongoDB, and a a full platform as a service. And... um, the closest analogy to what we were building was App Engine. And this was, we started building this before App Engine was out. And so it was definitely something, one of those things where you take your code, you give your code to us, and we run it. So a fully contained platform. And we actually wrote our own JavaScript engine, and the, the server-side code that you would build is all in JavaScript. And the idea, I think, was still was very good. I think it was pretty sound. I think App Engine launched about a year after we started working on it. And when App Engine first launched, people were sort of incredibly excited about it. And what you saw pretty quickly after that was people are like, wow, if I'm going to really buy into this platform, it has to have every single feature I could ever want. And that just doesn't, didn't seem very reasonable. And so we were looking at it. We were a startup. We had a few people. And basically, we said there's no way we could build everything you possibly need in order to really completely use this platform as a service. And if you can't use it for everything, the utility starts to drop dramatically. And if you look at App Engine, I think it started out not very popular and still it's, you know, almost eight, nine years later, and now it's starting to get more and more features, but it's still not, it still doesn't have everything, and it still suffers from the same kinds of problems. And so we looked at the full platform, and we thought the database was the most interesting part of it. Sort of, it was really less of a pivot and more of a, we're going to slice the top half of top half of what we were doing off and just focus on the database, which we were sort of the most interested in at that point. So you've got a bacon delivery service, and you need to notify your customers when their bacon has arrived at their doorstep. Twilio helps you make sure your customers get the bacon while it's hot. Twilio's programmable API lets you build SMS or voice alerts easily in the programming language of your choice, all in under five minutes with only a few lines of code. Now your customers get a text or a call the instant their bacon is ready. If your customers want to see the bacon frying on a hot pan, Twilio has video APIs and SDKs for the platforms that you know and love. Learn more at go.twilio.com slash podcast and get an additional $10 when you sign up and upgrade your account. 
That's go.twilio.com slash podcast. You will only pay for what you use, and it costs less than a penny to send a text. Get started at go.twilio.com slash podcast. Get your bacon delivery service cooking with Twilio's APIs for voice, SMS, and video. If you would have gotten the open source flywheel spinning, maybe you could have actually built out that whole platform. Was there was there some friction to getting open source heavily involved and sort of saying like, hey, this is where we're going roadmap wise, uh, and then you like lay out some kind of skeleton for all these different pieces that you would need. You know, that's, that's often how these smaller companies that are have an open core model try to leverage the community. We definitely thought about it. I would say open source, and I think it's hard to make that work. I don't think there are very many exam- many there there are not very many examples. There's huge execution like risk there. Um, and like you know, if you look at sort of the consortium model of open source, it's pretty messy. I would say not a huge number of you know successful things on building new kinds of technologies. That I don't think that's sort of a great way to sort of really innovate around sort of new models. And for something like that, I don't think we really thought that was likely to be successful. Were there other document-oriented databases at the time? So when we first published MongoDB, which was Febu- you know, as a public open source database, which was in February of 2009, uh, the other document database out there was CouchDB. I think it was really just the two of us. Okay. And so before Tengen, you were working at DoubleClick, which was eventually acquired by Google, and that was a really big business. Were there any lessons that you took away from DoubleClick that were valuable in the early days of Mongo? Yeah, I mean, frankly, a lot of the things we wanted to solve with MongoDB were problems we faced at DoubleClick. You know, DoubleClick was serving billions of ads per day. It was doing it you know, around the globe. The SLAs around the latency for serving ads was incredibly low. You know, the system had to be up 24-7. The business requirements for what the ad serving could do were changing constantly, you know, as ad serving sort of was evolving very rapidly. So, frankly, when we first, and then, you know, after DoubleClick, I started a company called ShopWiki, and then after ShopWiki was when we started Tengen. And frankly, when we started thinking about MongoDB, it really was, you know, let's build the database that we would want to use for every application we'd ever build from now on. And that was sort of the motivation. And it was very much a, selfish pursuit of i want a database that i want to use for everything let's make that happen and has that become the case is mongo the predominant database that you use internally at mongo uh definitely you know it's definitely the predominant database used internally it's you know i can't personally can't quite imagine using anything besides that at this point really so are there any edge cases that you have to use other databases for internally uh the only databases we use besides mongo are when like we do you know when we use software that just has to work with relational uh, like you know but otherwise, yeah, no, it's we're all uh, we're all Mongo. That's awesome. That's some serious dog fooding. Um, so the first product that the company offered was commercial support uh, for MongoDB. What kinds of support did people need in the early days? Like, why did they need support for their database? I mean, I think the you know I think the answer is the same now as it was then. I think databases are hard. They're complicated. And, you know, one of the things we want to do with MongoDB is make it easier and easier. But as applications get more and more complicated, the model that people are using is really to have stateless application servers that are sort of disposable and simple, and you tear them up, tear them down, and all the state relies on the database. And that is hard, right? Databases, you know, performance requirements factor in, you know, how fast your CPU is, how many you have, you know, how many disks you have, the latency of the disks, what kind those are, what kinds of transactions you're doing, you know, the ratio of reads to writes. So the complexity of running a database with high availability and making sure that the performance is exactly what you need, is, you know, is complicated. And one of the things we do on the product side is make that as easy as possible. And we have a lot of tools to make that as easy as possible. But I think, you know, it is complicated. And when there is downtime on a database, it's very costly. So the, the motivation to make sure your database is running perfectly all the time is pretty high. And if there is a problem, you want to have that problem solved as, fa- you know, as fast as humanly possible. Um, and that's where we can help. And in order to get the kind of introspection you need into 
a customer's deployment, do you have to give them a special version of Mongo, or do you have to have access to their systems somehow? Uh, we almost never do custom versions of MongoDB. Everything is sort of instrumented in the, the main the main version. Uh, definitely when we have access to their systems, it's easier often, but predominantly for most of our clients, we don't have access to their systems. And we either go through log data or monitoring data um, or you know, other things of that nature. But we, almost, we very rarely have actual access to their systems. So I've done a bunch of shows recently about these systems for distributed orchestration, like orchestration of Docker containers or some other kind of containers like Mesos or Kubernetes. And there are companies that are building this model where they sell a commercial version or they, they or they sell basically support. Like they, smell, they sell maybe a, an open source version, but they have support for it. And that's what you pay for. And what I always wonder about these companies is how you scale a commercial support team of engineers when the the uh, product you're building or the platform that you're supporting is often so new like kubernetes is very new how on earth do you scale up a commercial support team so i would ask the same question about mongodb in the early days when you there weren't very many people that knew what Mon- that knew how mongodb worked in terms of performance and what the gotchas are how did you scale the commercial support team so in the beginning and for quite a while the main people answering anything remotely complex on the support side were the engineers building it. I mean, when we first had our first commercial support client, we had nine people in the company. And, you know, the first person who ever answered a commercial support ticket was me. So, you know, in the very beginning, it was like that. And then after that, it really was just training. You know, we spent a lot of time training people, running boot camps, running war games, running sort of all the different things we can do. We've got a pretty complex shadowing program where people can ramp and learn from their peers. Uh, So it really just comes down to training. And, the, and then making sure the engineers are pretty heavily involved too, so that sort of everyone's really working together and it's very collaborative. Can you talk more about the tech stack that you use to run and manage MongoDB clusters? Do you mean uh, that clients use or I'm not entirely uh, sure like for, the so so okay well I guess I, I kind of jumped the gun because you're building this cloud service for running MongoDB that we'll get into um, and I assumed that the way that you like run and manage your MongoDB stuff internally is somewhat similar to how you manage the cloud service um, and so I want to eventually get into the cloud service but since we're talking about just a MongoDB internals right now. I'm sure you have lots of data internally, so I'm just wondering, do you host your own MongoDB clusters, or do you use a cloud service provider, uh, and what is the kind of instrumentation around your internal deployments? Yeah, so we uh, so we have a combination. We have a lot of MongoDB internally on our own hardware. That's at Colo somewhere. We've got our own MongoDB in the cloud on a number of different cloud providers. And all that's running using MongoDB management tools for running MongoDB uh, there are three different variants of that, which we can get into, and we actually use all variants of that on purpose. So we try to dog food every management tool that we offer, we use for managing something. So it's actually a little bit inconsistent internally, just because we want to dog food our own stuff so much. Uh, and then sort of for the infrastructure side, we mostly uh, we mostly use um, the Mongo tools and then a bunch of different other tools. Again, we try to test a lot of different configurations because... Um, it's more important for us to dog food and to make sure we know what's going to happen with our clients than to sort of have a very consistent internal infrastructure. Okay. So what have you built internally for redundancy and availability? And do you have like multi-cloud stuff going on? Can you talk more about that? Yeah. So for our, you know, I would say for our main and our most mission critical infrastructure, it's half in the cloud and half on-prem. And we, um, we, make, we, do, it, we do it that way. And we use you know a couple of different physical data centers, a couple of different cloud data centers, and have the um, data center, the physical data centers peered with the cloud, and that works quite well for sort of very high availability. Um, so as we move towards talking about the cloud service, what have been the changes in developer preferences since the early days of MongoDB? Do you mean our internal developers? Or uh, I, I, our, uh, sorry, developers I should, should, should have specified developers more generally. So, like in contrast to what we talked about early on, where you know, okay, developers want to model their system as documents rather than relational tables. That's a transition, and I feel like in the 
nine years since then, there have been plenty of other changes in the broader populace of developers in terms of what they prefer, how they like to build things. And so when you're thinking about product development, what are those changes in developer preferences that you think about? So, you know, obviously one of the big ones is cloud. When we first started building MongoDB, the cloud was, you know, sort of Amazon, for example, was just starting. And so now that is predominant. And that's sort of obviously a pretty big shift. And it means that people are used to getting infrastructure, you know, very easily and very quickly. Um, They're used to things like Amazon RDS for spinning up clusters. They want tools like that to make it very easy. So that's sort of one big area. The other really big area is services, sort of third-party services. And you can kind of combine it with microservices. So, you know, today applications tend to be built using, you know, a couple of internal microservices, maybe more, maybe less, and a bunch of different third-party services. So if you want to send text messages, you're going to use a service for that. If you want to do image resizing, you want to use a service for that. You know, when I did this a decade ago and we wanted to do video conversion, you know, we actually had to download software to, you know, when people uploaded videos, then we had to convert them ourselves on our own hardware and send them out. And now you would never do that, right? Now you're just going to use a service to do video conversion or image resizing or anything of that nature. And I think that is sort of fundamentally changing the way applications are built. And I think that's a, a pretty big paradigm shift. You know, otherwise, you know, developers really just want the most effective tool for the job. At the end of the day, developers really want to be focusing on sort of their, you know, what value they're adding and what their end user is experiencing and not so much on how to make it work. And I think, you know, we just need to make sure we're always sort of doing the right thing for that. What do you think is at the core of that preference for services? So, for example, you know, you mentioned text messaging. Why do people prefer Twilio? to standing up some AWS server somewhere with some kind of open source API for handling text messages? Why do people prefer services? I mean, it really comes down to sort of cost and simplicity. Doing it yourself requires you to actually get a server, learn how to run the software, make it highly available, make it redundant, handle issues when they come up. You know, it's just, it's a lot of work. It's complicated. And if you're trying to build a, you know, a new app and you want to add a feature, the last thing you want to do is take a week, you know, a week off of your main focus to go and spin this thing up. If you can use a service like Twilio, for example, you can go sign up and 10 minutes later, you're sending text messages. So it's just so much simpler, you know, and again, it just, it's all about focusing on actually building your application and not doing everything else. So it really just comes down to, you know, how fast you can get things done, how productive you are. You know, and again, you know, none of these services, you know, at some point, maybe the services aren't the most cost effective solution, but you've got to go to a pretty high end to get there. And for most people, these services are just by far the most cost effective way and time efficient way to get things done. So that brings us to MongoDB Atlas, which is a cloud service that you released for running MongoDB. Why did you release a cloud service? Yeah, so it's pretty simple. When we talk to our users, almost every user we talk to who's running in the cloud would love to hand off management of their cluster to us. They don't really want to manage it themselves. They just feel like they have to. And if it's one less thing they have to worry about, you know, one less thing they have to learn about, one less thing they have to set up, and rather than having to learn how to manage MongoDB, they can just let us do it for them, it's sort of a no-brainer. And if you look at sort of the way people are using other databases in the cloud, I think this is becoming, you know, more and more true for all databases, not just for MongoDB. And I think that any database that's going to be incredibly popular now or in the future has to have a service like this or developers aren't going to want to use it. It's just so much It's just so much easier um, for developers, for productivity, and it just makes a lot of sense. What's the difference from the developer's point of view between running a cloud service for a database versus running and managing that database on a server for the cloud service provider? So a little bit depends on what mode the developer is. When they're writing code, none. It's the exact same API, same rules, same everything. And that's one of the nice things about it. It is exactly the same database running in exactly the same way. But from an operations standpoint, you know, the setup time goes from, you know, learning, downloading, you know, figuring out how you want to set it up. So maybe hours or days to minutes. And the maintenance goes almost away. When you want to resize, when you've got to like sort of go from, you know, a small cluster to a larger cluster, you can now do it, you know, in a, you can, click a few buttons in a UI or call it, make an API call, and then we do all the heavy lifting on the back end. And not, not only are we doing it for you, but it's also fully automated by our systems, which are running not just your cluster, but thousands of other clusters. So you're actually getting the benefit of having thousands of clusters run by the same software, so the reliability just goes way up also. 
So it's both a lot easier for you and a lot more reliable because we're doing it at a much larger scale and are looking at all the edge cases and all the issues that could possibly arise and sort of know how to handle them. What kind of economies of scale do you, as MongoDB, what do you get out of uh, running this database as a service? So from our benefit, there's really two main things. One is, the, is you know, people like being able to offload this work and they will pay for it. And so, you know, it, Atlas is, we believe, the most cost-effective way for anyone to run MongoDB. So that's both a benefit for us and for our clients. Um, another big benefit for us is we also get to, you know, have the most experience running MongoDB, which lets us make MongoDB better for not just us, but for everyone else. Um, and lastly, the other really great thing about Atlas is that we think that users will be more successful with MongoDB if we can handle the management for them. And that's just, and again, that's good for everyone. You know, we want, you know, at the end of the day, we want everyone to be as successful with MongoDB as they possibly can, no matter where they're running it. But we believe that using MongoDB Atlas will make people as successful as possible, which is sort of, you know, good for everyone. And so for the developer, what are the benefits around scalability and availability, redundancy, what are these kind of, like, how do you get the, or what advantages do you get out of these when you're using a service versus hosting your own? So, you know, fundamentally at the technology level, it's the same technology. So you have the same high availability, same sharding, same, distribu- same distribution. So all the core pieces are the same. The difference is that when you're using it as a service, you don't have to configure it. You don't have to set it up. If hardware goes, you know, and you do get the added benefit that let's say you've got a, a replica set and you've got three nodes and one of the nodes actually physically goes away. Well, your cluster is still up no matter how you do it. But if you're using the service, then we're responsible for spinning up a new server, making sure the data gets synchronized. That's something that we handle as opposed to you having to handle. So on the availability side, we make sure that works. On the scaling side, if you want to go from like smaller nodes to bigger nodes, we do that automatically for you and while maintaining high availability. If you want to scale your sharded cluster, going from you know three shards to 10 shards, we sort of manage the process for you. So a lot of it comes down to the sort of ease and reliability, right? You st- you're still going to have high availability no matter how you deploy MongoDB. You're still going to have scalability no matter how you do it. It's just a question of how easy it is for you to get access to those things and how easy it is it and how reliable are those things going to work, you know, all the time. Does the architecture of the MongoDB Atlas service, this, you know, the experience is kind of like, you know, just like this endless pool of compute that is giving you a database as a service, is that the same experience that developers within MongoDB, the company have? Is it, did you replicate your own internal model for how people spin up databases? No, we built a model that we really thought people wanted. We never really had an internal service for this. Um, we sort of did what our clients did. Now all of our internal apps that use, all the new internal apps that use MongoDB uh, pretty much use Atlas except that we deal still use a few of our other management products just to make sure we test all of them and use all of them internally. But most of our new internal things are going onto Atlas. Is Atlas built uh, mostly on AWS? I think I read somewhere that it was mostly, it's mostly on AWS, right? So right now you can only spin up Atlas clusters on AWS. Next year we'll be adding support for Azure and for Google Cloud. Um, you know, we really want this to be cross cloud wherever you want to deploy your application. We want to have the service running there. Next year, we'll also let you do cross-cloud clusters. So you can have some nodes in Amazon, some nodes in Google, some nodes in Microsoft. So you can be redundant across cloud providers as well. Continuous integration gives you faster, safer software delivery. With a continuous integration tool like Snap CI from ThoughtWorks, the members of your team can push changes independently of each other, and they can all see their new builds running against different phases of tests before those changes make their way into production. The fastest moving companies that I've talked to on Software Engineering Daily are all using continuous integration. SnapCI from ThoughtWorks is available to anyone, and if you go to snap.ci slash softwareengineeringdaily, you can check it out for yourself and support Software Engineering Daily. With just a few clicks, I had my own continuous integration set up for some projects that were just sitting in my GitHub account without continuous integration. I got continuous integration up quite easily using SnapCI. 
If you want to be that hero at your company that starts moving your organization towards deploying often, more confidently, uh, towards that DevOps dream, start working with SnapCI at snap.ci slash software engineering daily. Your coworkers will see you working with SnapCI and they will fall in love with it themselves. Oftentimes it takes somebody at a bigger company to go out on their own and say, okay, I'm going to roll out CI even though nobody else at the company is using it. And maybe that hero at the company is going to be you. So check out snap.ci slash software engineering daily. And thanks to ThoughtWorks for being a continued sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. It really means a lot. Are there uh, Amazon managed services that you use or do you avoid using them to avoid lock-in and keep your costs low? So we don't use too many Amazon services, not for those reasons, but mostly because we wanted to build something that would work across any cloud. So we want to, you know, the same solution that we have on Amazon today, we want to have on Google and Microsoft. And so we really want to make sure that we use sort of the lowest level features so that we can, you know, replicate on whatever clouds our clients want. Um, we don't want to be, we don't want, only want to offer a service on Amazon because we have a lot of clients who are interested in both, you know, Amazon, Azure, and Google. So there are services on AWS that have similar um analogs on Google or Azure, like an elastic load balancer, for example. I, I'm pretty sure that Google and Azure have some similar service. I don't know for sure. Um, but when you see something like that, I mean, do you, does that lower the barrier to uh, to your desire of, of using a managed service? I think it would. I think that, you know, one of the things that is different about Atlas is Atlas is actually a, a pretty low level function. So we actually, you know, the main thing we use on EC2 is both the hardware and the, you know, and the VPCs and security groups. At the end of the day, Atlas is really just about running MongoDB. And so we, you know, none of the tools that any of the clouds offer are going to let you manage a cluster or let, sort of let you manage a Mongo cluster, like, you know, doing rolling upgrades or scaling up a sharded cluster. And so it's, you know, because it's not sort of a complex web, ser- web service or anything like that, the, the tools that we need from the cloud service providers, frankly, aren't all that complicated. And so we're able to sort of use something that's pretty low level that's going to work everywhere. Why did you start with AWS? Uh, simply because that, you know, we basically go where the, our users tell us they want to go. And that is definitely where most of our users would like us to be first. So now why, why is that? Because it seems like if they're just accessing the MongoDB Atlas service, it doesn't matter, you know, what the cloud service provider is, right? So there are two reasons why you, you sort of care. One is latency. Right, so if your application servers are sitting in Amazon, it's nice if your databases are in Amazon also, just because it's a little bit closer. And then two, on the security side, so for example, we can now, you know, so every Atlas cluster, every Atlas group gets their own Amazon VPC. And now we can actually peer your Atlas VPC with your application VPCs so that you can keep things very secure. So you do not have to go, you don't, you do not have to send your database traffic onto the public network at all. So, you know, th- for those two reasons alone, you're sort of interested in keeping things inside of one cloud, you know, as you're sort of architecting your, your system. So it just makes it easier when you think of, you know, if you're using services like, you know, Amazon Lambda, or even if you're just, you know, spinning up EC2 instances, being able to go through sort of the internal Amazon network, not over the public network with the lowest possible latency is uh, pretty adv- advantageous. Do the failure cases get more complex and because like we didn't really discuss this but mongodb has a lot of um you know redundancy and uh failure resilience built into just kind of how it works but does it does that get more complicated for you as the service provider like node failures on aws is does working around that become complicated or maybe you could just walk me through what happens during a node failure on aws so it's kind of interesting, right? Because it's both more complicated because we have to handle it at a larger scale, but because we have to handle it at a large scale, it's all fully automated. So, you know, if a node goes down in your cluster, we will just automatically know that and then replace it. So we have to build that software. We have to go, you know, determine whether or not the node is down transiently or down permanently. Then we've got to make a decision about what to do. But because we sort of have to do it in an automatic fashion, we sort of have already built 
all of that logic and all those systems. So on a day-to-day -day basis, it's actually very simple. You know, the only you know complicated things that might arise, and we've actually built things to handle this, is let's say you're in an Amazon region, and we support many different Amazon regions. But what if you're in a region and an entire and an entire availability zone goes down? And how do you handle that? And we've got our own playbooks for that, and we've got systems to detect it. But you know, again, we've never experienced that. Um, I don't think it's happened in a couple of years. But it's those kinds of things that I think would be more complicated that we just haven't even seen yet. So one of my uh, favorite infrastructure episodes that I did was this episode about Dropbox moving off of the cloud. It was just like they moved off of AWS and it took them like two years to re-architect their infrastructure and build essentially their own version of Amazon S3 and write the software for their data centers. It was really epic. Um, but the lesson that I took away from that is if if you're an infrastructure company, it's ki it can be erased. I mean, Dropbox is not even an infrastructure. I mean, it's kind of an infrastructure company, but it's more like a uh, user or a you know user level service. Anybody would could use it, and it has this veneer of a really nice user interface. And yet, they still had to do this migration in order to keep their margins high. Um, do do you think that's like a possibility of in the future, like where you would want to move to your own hardware in in order to um, to get get margins that would be higher than you would get on a cloud service provider? Yeah, you know, I think we would ever move. I think that people are going to want their infrastructure where they want it, but I don't think it's implausible to imagine us having our own data centers where you might be able to get a you know Atlas at a different price point. I don't think so. I don't think it would be a wholesale movement because sometimes, you know, if you're an Amazon, some people are just going to want their databases in Amazon no matter what. But it comes down to maybe you can get your MongoDB clusters elsewhere at a lower price. The company Wired Tiger was a company that Mongo acquired not too long ago, and they make a storage engine. And as I understand, that the, this acquisition was um, was kind of important to the creation of Atlas. So. Um, maybe we could talk a bit about that. Um, I guess, first of all, what is a database storage engine? Right, so a database storage engine is simply how the database s puts data onto disk, how it stores it onto disk, and how it handles the sort of durability and transactionality of that. So when you write to Mongo, Mongo's got to do a bunch of stuff. It's got to look at indexes and determine if, you know, what's valid and do aggregations and all that stuff sort of in sort of the core Mongo. And then at the end of the day, it's got to sort of insert something into the in, you know, onto disk or get something off of disk. And that's what the storage engine is all about. Um, and it needs to do that obviously very reliably and very quickly um, and very safely. Why are there different ways of doing that? It seems like that would be a uh, kind of a very straightforward, universally well-studied sort of thing. What are the subjectivities in building a storage engine? So storage engines are, you know, are, are simply very complicated. So a number of things have changed a lot over the last you know, couple of decades. And I think that if you look at sort of the best storage engines from today versus 20 years ago, um, a lot of it looks the same. But if you think about sort of the hardware that's changed and how, much fa you know, how fast computers are to things like SSDs versus spinning disks, um, to think about like memory, Right, you know, 20 years ago, the amount of memory you had on systems was very low compared to now. So the nature of how these things have to work is very different. The requirements are much more complicated around performance, and so there's a number of different storage engines. Now there aren't actually that many, you know, popular storage engines out there. You know, just like databases, there are not hundreds. You know, there's maybe a handful of really good storage engines. And Wired Tiger, the company, was created by the same people who built Berkeley DB, which has sort of been the predominantly most popular storage engine for the last almost 30 years. So really people who sort of have done this before and are really building sort of the best modern storage engine for sort of the new kind of uh, kinds of requirements and kinds of hardware that people use. So what did Wired Tiger do that you didn't have with your own storage engine? So Wired Tiger let us, at the end of the day, the main thing it brought on was a much higher throughput storage engine. So the concurrency in Wired Tiger the overall performance and latency of WireTiger was a lot better than our previous storage engine. And sort of in parallel, we were both working on our own storage engine and had plans on how to improve it. And we're also looking at other alternatives to how we can go much faster. And at the end of the day, WireTiger, we both really liked the product. We really liked the team. Uh, we thought it would not just, you know, let us solve what we needed to do to solve that day, but really accelerate our roadmap by a number of years. 
And so it really made sense to us to sort of acquire the company, the team, and the product, and uh, switch to that as sort of our main storage engine. Were there some ways that that acquisition empowered you to build this cloud service, the MongoDB Atlas service? I'm not sure the sort of direct impact for Atlas. I think that overall, you know, it did two things. One, it means that we were able to do more things and have more use cases for MongoDB. So I think it overall impacted the overall business quite dramatically. And so the sort of the secondary impacts in Atlas are, are pretty large. Not really sort of a direct correlation, more of a, you know, secondary correlation. I understand. So I'd like to zoom out a little bit and talk about databases more broadly. So there are these databases that call themselves new SQL, these things like Crate or MemSQL or VaultDB. And I've done a number of shows about these. What is driving the creation of these new databases? So I think if if you're specifically referring to what's driving sort of the new SQL databases, I think mostly that is around performance and around scalability. I mean, people are trying to solve those problems in the relational world. And I think that's sort of, you know, the main motivation there, you know, not being at one of them. Can you can you talk more about that? Like, what are the performance and scalability requirements uh, that these different databases are, are attacking? So, you know, so one of the challenges with relational databases as compared to Mongo is that, let's say, let's go back to our user profile example. So if you've got, you know, 50 tables that represent your user profile, and for a given user, you may have any you may have hundreds of rows that represent that user. If they're all if all you know three hundred rows are sitting on one physical server, doing that join is costly, but not insane. And you probably will cache it somewhere in memcache or something, but you can do it and it's sort of okay. But now let's say those three hundred rows are spread across six different machines. Now that join is not just about getting 300 rows off disk, it's now about getting 300 rows from six different servers and putting it together. And now let's say you want to sort of modify a user atomically, well now you've got to do a transaction that goes across those six servers. So with MongoDB, that's all in one document, so it's a lot simpler, but in the relational world, horizontal scaling has always been really hard and the solutions have always been very expensive. And I think those new SQL companies are trying to solve that problem in a a cheaper, more cost-effective way. You know, it's not that it hasn't been done before. It's just that they'd like to do it in a cheaper method. And, um, you know, f- for all the legacy applications that are on relational, where moving to MongoDB might be, you know, more work than they can handle right now, but they do want a sort of a better, more scalable database. Why is it that horizontal scaling is easier to handle in Mongo? So it really comes down to the data model once again. You know, if you've got your user profile and it's sitting in one document, the number of cases where you need to do joins across data types or documents or transactions across documents, it doesn't go to zero, but it grows dramatically lower. And if you don't have to do joins or transactions across documents, horizontal scaling becomes much easier because you don't have to do things like two-phase commits. You don't have to move as much data across the network. And so it's just a, a simpler problem to solve and also a more scalable, so you can more easily have a scalable solution. So one trend that I've been doing some shows on is this trend of uh, building these bigger in-memory platforms, or just, uh, I guess this is a combination of um, needing to have faster um, access to large data sets as well as a decrease in cost in memory. I think those are both trends that are true. Um, Maybe I'm wrong. But uh, how do you see that impacting the database landscape, like the the rise of of systems that keep more stuff in memory? So I think it really depends on the database industry. You know, one of the things that we really try very hard at MongoDB to do is to let you configure MongoDB such that you can handle different kinds of things and do different kinds of things. And our distributed architecture lets us do that very nicely. So for example, we have our Wired Tiger storage engine, which is pretty traditional, stores data on disk, does sort of what you'd expect from a database to do. And we also have an in-memory storage engine for MongoDB. So you, you can run a single MongoDB cluster with some nodes in memory and some nodes persistent you know, as a regular database. And then if you want to keep your data in memory, to have sort of the highest possible throughput or lowest possible latency, you can do that. But you can also have the data persisted to disk, so it's very safe. 
So for a lot of applications, it's not that their throughput is too high for a non-in-memory database, but the, it's really, really a, about handling spikes. So let's say you're in the finance industry. You know, from 9 a.m. to 4 p.m., your traffic is, you know, two orders of magnitude higher higher than it is at other points of the day. You know, if you're looking at sort of a gaming thing, you like at a game launch time or you're going to have these, you know, really crazy spikes. So you need to be able to handle those spikes, but your throughput throughout the day isn't so crazy. And those are kind of use cases where in-memory is really good. Or if you've got a ton of data and you need really fast aggregations. So for us at MongoDB, it's all about letting you do different kinds of things inside the same database cluster. So it's sort of from a, from a developer standpoint, you don't have to think about it so much, but then when you go and you need to optimize it, you've got the right knob so that you can do things pretty quickly. So for us, both the in-memory trend and sort of this large data trend work pretty nicely, but I think for databases that can't sort of do those kinds of things in the same cluster very easily, you know, may have trouble. The listeners have let me know that they like episodes about management. So you are the CTO of MongoDB. I consider this a unique opportunity to ask you about management because most of the shows I do are about, um, they tend to be like uh, web application companies. And I guess MongoDB is kind of becoming one with Atlas, but you start out as a database company. And I'm I'm wondering what are the unique aspects of management within a database company? Like, how do you think about features and support and new products? And just how do you organize your day? Or is it no different than any other software company you've worked at? And I think the biggest change with MongoDB from a lot of the companies you've probably talked to is two things. One is that, you know, most people use MongoDB, they download it and deploy it. So it is ship software. Right? It's not a service. It's not a web application. If there's a bug and we introduce a bug, it's going to live at, we have to deal with it for years. You know, when we release a version of MongoDB, you know, we have people running, you know, versions of MongoDB from years ago, and we sort of, we have to support that. We have to make that work. So that's sort of one big change, which sort of changes a lot of what you have to do on the product side. And the other big thing is that, you know, we can't break the database, right? We can't add features that add instability or add risk. You know, the database has to work all the time, has to be the most reliable piece of your stack. And so that, and but but at the same time, you know, we are a new database company, so we do need to evolve, we need to add, we do need to add a lot of features, we need to sort of continue to innovate. And so one of the big challenges that we have is how do you both innovate, add features quickly in an incredibly safe and reliable way. And I think that is one of these sort of pretty unique challenges that database companies have. Um, which is made even more complicated because we also ship software as, you know, predominantly. So I think those are pretty challenging. And, you know, a lot of it comes down to just, you know, incredibly strong process around, you know, user design, which, you know, on the database side, is not about sort of UIs, it's but about, it's about user, you know, API design and query language design and making sure that we spend a lot of time focusing on those things because if, you know, if we do something, we have to li- live with it for years around, you know, a huge amount of effort on tested and automated testing. You know, we built our own continuous integration system because the testing infrastructure required for MongoDB is sort of pretty vast. And we need someone that could do that, you know, very effectively and very efficiently across thousands of machines. So a lot of the stuff, you know, a lot of work on automated testing, a lot of work on sort of a really good process around both finding issues, finding bugs, um, the, the design, and so just uh, a really a pretty rigorous engineering process that we've been developing over the last, you know, seven, eight years. Well, now I have to ask you about that continuous integration system. How do you build a continuous integration system for a database? So if you think about it, there's two big challenges that we have. One is we have to cha- test across a lot of different systems. So, you know, we test automatically on, I don't know the exact number, but a, like a bunch of different Linux versions. Um, a, you know, we test on different versions of Mac OS, we test on different versions of Windows, we support Solaris, we support um, the IBM Z platform, we support the IBM PowerPC platform, we support ARM. So we support a number of different hardware platforms, a number of OS platforms, and a lot of different versions across those platforms. So I think it's about somewhere in the 30 to 40 different sort of hardware OS variants. So that's sort of challenge number one. Challenge number two is that Ignoring sort of soak tests that run for multiple days, sort of the basic unit and functional tests for MongoDB to run on a single box on a single OS would take about, I believe it in the current numbers, around 40 hours. So that's obviously, you know, so 40 hours times 30 to 40 variants is a lot of time. And 
what we found over the number of years is that the the longer it takes to run that test, you the odds of sort of bugs getting into sort of master or conflicts happening goes up. And so it's incredibly important to drive that down to as low as possible. So we have we're working towards an SLA of about an hour from you being able to, from a commit going in to having a fully tested version of MongoDB binary. So that means we need to sort of parallelize across you know each one each operating system variant around 40 ways. So I just do the math. That's around 1,600 servers. Um, we also have systems for doing performance testing in every commit. So that's adds even more resources to that. And we also want developers who are developing on whatever operating system they want to develop on to be able to very quickly, in a matter of minutes, push a change set to the CI system and test it not just on one operating system but on a number of systems with whatever sort of test suites they want to test. And uh, at the end of the day, there is nothing that we could find that sort of did that in an efficient way. And obviously, we want to do it in a cost-effective way as well. So we have real hardware that sits under this. We use the cloud for this. We bid on EC2 spot instances. So it's a pretty complex system to sort of make all this work, uh, both reliably and then on the performance side, you want it to be sort of predictable. So uh, it's a pretty complex system. It's interesting what you say about just really not being able to make breaking changes because you're a database um, and I, I don't mean to pick on Docker but like I hear people talking about Docker recently and just saying uh, the, the faith in the product has kind of been shaken because there are breaking changes on a regular basis and people just want a boring way to run containers um, so yeah I guess that's a uh, Maybe an important lesson for for any for any infrastructure company. Yeah, we spend an inordinate amount of time working around things so that users don't have to get impacted. You know, even on minor things, when we make when we make we make an up when we make an upgrade accidentally harder than it should be, it's a huge deal. And so we spend a huge amount of time making sure upgrades require as little work as humanly possible from any of our users. And it's sort of a huge focus of ours. Otherwise, people just don't upgrade, and they're using old versions forever. They don't get to use new features. They don't get the new benefits of sort of better systems. Uh, so we spend a huge amount of time on that. Are there any business opportunities or product opportunities in the Mongo space, or maybe even just in the database space, that you wish somebody would build a business around? So I think um, you know, if you ignore the ones that we are in or potentially going in, you know, I think that, you know, one of the interesting things that's going to, you know, that's happening, I I mentioned this before, is around services. And I think that one of the interesting challenges that someone's going to have to solve at some point is how do you do an analytics across all these services? So let's, you know, at MongoDB, we use dozens of different services to keep track of data, to do client things, you know, whatever it is, you know, website analytics. And doing analysis across that is hard. So we do, I think what a lot of people do now is we take a lot of that data and we dump it into MongoDB and then we sort of analyze it. And that that works, but it's not, it doesn't feel right to me at least. And I, I do think there's going to be some solution over the next couple of years that's developed that lets you do things like analyze data across all your services without having to, you know, put it all in one place so that it's actually cost effective. You know, and, and we can do that pretty easily now because, you know, we also know a lot about databases. We know a lot about how to move data around. We help clients with this all the time, but it's not a fundamentally easy or pleasant thing to do. And I think over time that there should be better systems to doing that, especially as more and more applications are built using lots of different services. I think this is going to be a bigger and bigger challenge. Uh, so that's definitely an area that I'm personally pretty interested in someone else uh, trying to solve absolutely yeah these services are certainly making life a lot easier as a developer um i remember writing programs 10 or or not 10 years ago but maybe eight years ago six or six or seven or eight years ago uh and just the amount of upfront work you had to do relative to today uh was copious um but anyway elliot uh i want to thank you for coming on the show it's been great talking to you and um I'm really happy to have MongoDB as a sponsor of Software Engineering Daily. So uh, thanks again for coming on the show. Great. Thank you, Jeff. Thanks to Symphono for sponsoring Software Engineering Daily. Symphono is a custom engineering shop where senior engineers tackle big tech challenges while learning from each other. 
check it out at symphono.com slash se daily that's s-y-m-p-h-o-n-o dot com slash se daily thanks again symphono wow